the one. So hello and welcome. You know, we appreciate that you could join us and I do hope you are having a marvelous and depending on where you're living, a safe day. I'm your host, Charles Collegy, the security analyst for Accelerated Strategies Group. Now today's DevOps webinar on comprehensive API and service connectivity with Kubernetes and this webinar is brought to you by Red Hat and Kong. I have with me today Stu Miniman, Director of Market Insights for Red Hat, and Raza Shafri. Sh 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 I always get one name wrong. Who's, uh, sorry, Raz, a, a VP of uh, pr Product at Kong, and Ned Harris, who is a Solution Engineer at Kong. You know, so they will be discussing how to really deal with API security uh, within the uh, Kubernetes environment. And I know they're eager to fill you in on this topic. However, the meat of today's webinar has to be delayed a few moments as I have to go over the housekeeping deal. So please note that this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on demand and you will receive an email with the link, but at any time, you can go to devops.com and gain access to this and all of the archived on-demand webinars we have available. So feel free to peruse our webinar library. So now a few comments on the big marker platform we use. The first item is that on the right hand of the screen, you'll see the chat button. You know, this feature allows everyone uh, online to interact with us during the event. You know, let us know where you're from. Uh, talk about uh, items that are going on in the discussion. We want to hear your feedback and, you know, real-time feedback uh, can help uh, pace and direct the uh, discussions to what you want. We want the feedback and we want to hear from you. Now for questions, we ask that you do not use the chat. You know, sometimes when uh, there's a lot of chat going on and the pace of uh, activities, questions can be missed. So it's best to use the Q&A window, which is directly next to the chat tab. So we'll try to answer as many of your submitted questions as possible before the end of today's session. But if we're not able to get to them, I'm sure that Red Hat and Kong will follow up. And lastly, you'll see a handout button. There you'll be able to get today's uh, presentation. Now, of course, if you've been with us a number of times, you understand that one of the most important housekeeping items is that at the end of today's webinar, we will be awarding four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stay with us until the end to see if you're selected. So it's not, now it's time to jump into today's session with uh, uh, with with Ned and uh, and and Stu and Sharon. And I'm going to get this name and wrong. Again. Reza. 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 All right. All right, Charles. And, uh, I think, uh, Stu, you take it away, right? Yeah, absolutely. And hi, everybody. It's uh, great to see so many people on. This is live. So I, I see we've got folks. Good morning on the West Coast. We've got, uh, you know, friends coming over from, from Europe and Africa. So good afternoon or good evening. Uh, as Charles said, my name is Stu Miniman. I'm the director of Market Insights uh, with Red Hat. Uh, some of you might know me uh, before I joined Red Hat last year. I spent a decade as an analyst and a host of a video program called The Cube. So I'm excited. Rez and I are going to start off, uh, talk a little bit about industry trends, which I've got a lot of experience doing. Um, Reza, you just want to give a quick introduction to yourself, too, before we dive into it? Yes, Reza Shafi. I don't think I've ever heard so many variations of my name before. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, great to be here and uh, really looking forward to a chat. I'm the VP of product at COG. Uh, really looking forward to talking about all things connectivity, containers, open shift. It's going to be an exciting webinar. Awesome. And, and Ned, we're, we're going to bring you back in a little bit to uh, get some hands-on demo and everything like that, but go ahead and give a quick intro. 
Yeah, so Ned Harris, um, I'm a senior solution engineer here at Kong. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to showing you how this all looks, works, and feels. Awesome. All right. So Reza, let, let's talk to just a little bit of kind of level setting here. Um, you know, Kubernetes, uh, you know, such, you know, sometimes it's a buzzword, um, you know, backstage when we were getting ready, we were talking when some of us had originally crossed paths in the heady days of Docker and containers, uh, you know, back when we used to go to events and, you know, bump into each other at parties and the like. Uh, but you know, let, let, let's give a level set. You know, why are customers adopting Kubernetes? What, what's so important there? What, what, what's happening in the conversations you're having with users? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because yeah, we were talking about the uh, the Austin DockerCon. I think that was like three years ago that we we were all there, or four years ago. And back then, we're still trying to figure out what does this all mean. And I think things have settled pretty well in that containers became, have become the currency that everyone is thinking about in terms of how you package your services, your the components, the, the atomics of your application. And so with containers being that currency, with containers being that logical unit that you, you deploy these, that's obviously why Kubernetes has become so predominant. That's at least one reason, right? Because it becomes effectively the target platform which runs your containers. But I think the more important aspect also is that not only does it provide you that target platform that accepts containers as the deployment unit, but it also has become the sort of neutralizing layer because it is also the layer that is making multi-cloud actually possible or multi-cloud and hybrid and on-prem possible, right? And I think this is why it's great to see OpenShift uh, having really, you know, realized that vision that four or five years ago we we're just talking about, but now has become that neutralizing layer over all these different infrastructures. So it's interesting because Kubernetes always started with a lot of other goals as well, like cost optimization and, and, and resource optimization scheduling. Those are still very important. But it feels to me that those other reasons I mentioned at the beginning is, is what's actually predominant in many of the customers' mind or users' mind that I speak. Yeah, it, it's interesting, Reza. When I, when I think through my career, uh, we, we talk about the silos that everyone lives in. And I, I think one of the challenges you have, you talk about that optimization. In many ways, in the early days of containerization, it was that continuum of we'd had physical servers, then we virtualized things, so I didn't need to think about the server. And now maybe I, you know, containerization can have me think about less of that infrastructure. We've been talking about this invisible infrastructure for quite a long time now. But why does infrastructure exist? The whole reason we need infrastructure is for those applications. And there is uh, just, uh, you know, such a change happening in the application space. And we think that is where Kubernetes really has a huge opportunities in the customers. Uh, you know, you, you saw it plenty when your time at Red Hat, and you're, you're seeing it now. Um, that, that transformation that companies are going through, not just buying things and not changing them, but building their own, modifying things, as well as, of course, SaaS and ISV applications. So Kubernetes is really that platform for applications. Um, and dev and ops you know, need to come together some uh, to be able to make sure that works. And of course, security in the mix there. So I guess ne next question I have for you, you know, where are you? Where, where, where are customers, you know, where are they uh, along that journey? Uh, you know, wh what are some of the great advances they have? And are there any stumbling blocks you're seeing that, you know, you can help companies with? Yeah. So if you, if you think about the trends we were just talking about, right, the application architecture has fundamentally started to change from monoliths and three-layered uh, you know, architectures to microservices architecture. Uh, we've, we're seeing the infrastructure architecture change from a virtualized world to a containerized world. And we're seeing multi-cloud become more and more important. So if you think about this mega trends, one of the things that it brings to the fold is connectivity. And, and Kong really is, you know, we are the cloud connectivity company, uh, or we, we really, like, connectivity is our DNA. And so with this uh, changes, these mega trends we just talked about, one of the things that exponentially increases is the number of components that need to talk to each other over the, over the wire, right? Um, and so how do you enable a world where as these number of components increases exponentially, you can enable developers to focus on the business logic and how to build the best customer experience while you sort of 
decouple the concerns around reliable connectivity, around secure connectivity between these different components. That's where Kong's mission is, is to enable this type of connectivity. And it should be really as much just like you plug a device into electricity and it just works. We want to, we're not there yet, but we want to be there, right? And, and we were just like pushing the envelope to make that happen. Yeah, no, so, so some great points there, Reza. It's, uh, you know, something we've been saying for a long time. We've really gone beyond human scale in a lot of these environments. So we need to have solutions there. Automation is built in. As you said, if it can be more of a utility type mm -hmm. environment where, you know, I don't as an admin need to think about these or, or watch rules. You know, I, I have to build systems and architect them um, because it's funny. You see some of the debates in the industry. It was, you know, monolith bad, microservices good. It's like, well, hey, there are trade-offs here. Architecturally, you know, there, there's not a silver bullet. We understand that, you know, everything in IT tends to be additive and things do change over time. So yeah. I, I guess brings me to kind of kind of the last question for kind of the, the beginning discussion here is as customers are looking to modernize, you know, what are those new challenges that they're facing? Uh, you know, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to first, and actually this is a good segue to talk about something you said, the whole monolith bad microservices good, right? Uh, so many times we assume we as an industry that the world starts with the latest greatest thing and then you go build on top of it right and and you know again and again customers remind us that it's a journey and they have to deal with the rest of the stack you know you know someone was said we're we're really bad at throwing our garbage out in in our business uh you have to deal with the previous layers and layers and layers of technology and it's a journey to continually modernize right and so one of the principles that at kong we also have is to make sure that Whatever we do allows for this journey to happen. You don't just assume the, 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 the end uh, state, right? That's critical. So uh, that also answers, I think, the second question you brought up, which is uh, overall, we want to help our customers in this journey, in this journey towards containerization, towards microservices. How can we enable them to do that? How can we enable them to actually support the old, you know, what we call legacy um, Java EE layers while also going to as microservices containers and starting to migrate the ones that make sense, right? So enabling that journey is a big part of what we do. Okay. Reza, that, that, that's that, that's great. I, I think we touched on a lot of pieces here. Um, I'm going to go through just a couple of slides to talk a little bit more about kind of the application platform discussion uh, that we're having. We'll pull a note, Ned, for the demo, and then I'm going to bring you back uh, for, for the Q&A as we, we get back a little bit. So thanks, uh, thanks for the start, and we'll, we'll see you in a little bit. Sounds good. All right. Let me see if I can grab the slides here. And all right, hold on. At the end. All right. So um, hopefully uh, many of you have, have attended some of these uh, series of webinars we're doing. So I'm not really going to be spending much time on Red Hat OpenShift. Of, of course, if you want to learn more about it, you go to cloud.redhat.com. You can learn lots more about it. Reach out to it. Um, I, I want to tie into the conversation that Reza and I were just having here um, is what is happening with your application portfolio. So it is really what, what we call uh, this hybrid architectural decisions that you need to make uh, as an organization. And hybrid doesn't just mean kind of the hybrid cloud that we've been talking about for the last 10 years, which is I have my data center and I'm adopting public cloud. Really hybrid is a total architectural uh, view of things. So it's, it's not just the infrastructure, which of course is changing, not only your data centers, public cloud hosted environment, but edge computing. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll, I'm hoping we'll get a question and talk about edge a little bit because that just adds a whole lot more surface area uh, and, and devices to think about things. But the, the application discussion that we just started talking about at the beginning. So, uh, while, while companies traditionally bought shrink wrap software and didn't necessarily change it today, it's it's the building of differentiated applications and then uh, adopting other software to help my business. Because uh, as I said up front, infrastructure only exists to run the applications and applications are really the driver for our business. The data that I have, how do I take advantage of that? How do I interact uh, with my end customers and what they're doing? Uh, and we need to do that in a much more hybrid environment. Uh, 
what, what have we seen the last year or so uh, with, with the pandemic going on? Uh, but, you know, we need to be able to reach people where they are and we need to be able to move fast. So that changing application environment is, is something that can be a bit challenging uh, for many companies. When we talk about the overall journey going on, there are some companies that have been doing this for a long time and others where, you know, hey, I might only have a developer in my company. Well, if you only have one developer, getting the most out of that developer is even more important than if you add, you know, 20 or 100 developers. Uh, but, you know, that developer productivity uh, and that speed that you can react to what the business needs is so important. So that is where the, the applications are required. And as Reza talked about, Kubernetes and containers lets my infrastructure be that 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 unit of consumption is much closer uh, to what we see in the application. And we should also hopefully be able to unlock the value of data and turn that ultimately into insights. So uh, with OpenShift, we've got thousands of customers you know, running in production, in deployment, and the unlocking of data with new uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies uh, with, with new modern databases is so important uh, to be able to move fast and uh, you know keep up with the requirements uh, of, of my customers as well as uh, what's happening in the competitive space. So you know, hybrid really uh, can, can to become your advantage overall uh, in this world here. So if we look at what's happening in the application space, um, there are challenges, there are new tool sets that you need to learn. And I need to think about uh, how we can have, uh, as, as Reza talked about also, some consistency uh, where, where uh, I'm working on things. So um, you don't wanna build uh, in the traditional world Every application kind of had its own stack and its own team managing it. As much as possible, you want to build consistency so that your developers, whether they're working on one application or another, whether we're working in the data center, the public cloud, we're starting to look at the edge, uh, all have consistent environments. So that is where we've been working you know, heavily at Red Hat in the container and Kubernetes space. And that is the, the promise of OpenShift is to give that consistency of how we interact with an environment, the consistency of how we build, how we deploy and how we manage an environment across a broad set of applications. So as we said before, uh, this uh, really spans a lot of different applications. So there are still lots of uh, ISV deployed applications, as well as the ones that you are building or are modifying uh, for, for your environments. Um, and the, the, the last slide that I really wanna talk about is it can be, uh, there, there's a big stack that gets built here. And at Red Hat, we don't do this alone. Uh, this is very much done with a broad ecosystem of partners. Everything that we do in OpenShift is open source and we've built uh th th there's uh the these things called operators operators allow applications to be not only packaged and deployed but also the life cycle to be maintained over uh a period of time uh through updates uh, to make sure that they uh can be managed easier from your environment so operators are not specific just to openshift but really built for kubernetes so something that you know as, as i said 100 percent open source we want to make sure the the uh the community can really drive these technologies and operators there's over 150 of them in the red hat marketplace and every month we are seeing more operators in the market uh kong of course uh you know has operators now uh we actually had a press release go out last week uh to talk about the completion of some of this to make it easier for uh you know kong deployments in a red hat open shift environment so with that, uh, we're going to bring Ned in, who's going to actually dive in and show us a bit of, of the Kong uh, de deployment. Ned? Awesome. Well, what I'm going to be doing here is uh, basically, I kind of wanted to show a day in the life of how Kong and OpenShift will play together with a kind of a little contrived app, like a little microblog site. And I'm hoping doing this, I can kind of show you um, how this all works and, and some of the potential you have to really make your life easier, make this a lot more manageable and a lot more governed. So in this kind of um, application, we have a microblog site that basically you're just gonna write some text to it and it's gonna do a little natural language processing. 
and give you some sentiment analysis and kind of write your, your blog entries. Now in doing this, we have two types of traffic that we're gonna to have to contend with. We have what some people traditionally call this north to south traffic, and then you have this east to west traffic. Now, I kind of think those terms kind of confuse people sometimes. So the way I like to explain it is think of this as a, your application like a building. This is the very front door of your building. So, you know, we're gonna have different concerns that we're gonna to need to address with this front door. Things like maybe like rate limiting, um, off, things of that nature, m many others, but really specific for that type of traffic, that type of connectivity. But once you're past that front door and you're kind of in the hallways of, you know, to keep the building analogy going, you're gonna have different um, types of, you know, governance concerns going from within the building. And this is where we're gonna lean on the Kong Mesh to deal with this kind of direct service to service uh, governance. So we have two products with Kong. We're gonna be using the Kong Gateway. And in this case, since we're in OpenShift, we're gonna use the native uh, Kong Ingress controller, which is basically the Kong Gateway kind of wrapped in a bunch of custom resource definitions to give you that really native Kubernetes experience so that you can manage it with your typical OC commands that you'd use in OpenShift. Now, what that ingress controller is gonna give us besides just having a reverse proxy for your traffic is it's gonna give us access to a large number of kind of pre-made policies or what we call Kong plugins. And you can see we have a lot of these plugins ready to go in different categories from security to traffic control uh, to rate, you know, monitoring, uh, reporting, et cetera. Now, what this does is it gives us the ability, instead of having to write a bunch of middleware into these different services to control things like a rate limiting, for example, we can offload these to the gateway. And that's gonna save our developers a lot of effort because especially when you go from a monolith to a microservice pattern, all that middleware you have to write becomes like an end scale problem. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the gateway handle some of that and we're gonna let our, our services get kind of rooted down to the core competency of what they are. So I think enough talking, let's just maybe show this in action. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna basically take a uh, one of those policies that I've shown you, a basic rate limit policy. And you'll see that, you know, I can describe it in a very native Kubernetes way. So we're using these, these custom resource definitions within, you know, the OpenShift platform. And what I'm gonna do is just declare a plugin and I'm gonna give it a really simple configuration of five requests per minute. Now, I do wanna show you just to show that nothing up my sleeve how this works. Like I can go and, and do a Git blog and I have a few of them here already. And you can see we get our, our blog entry and our little sentiment score. And you can see like, if I look at the header, there's not really too much going on as far as like rate limiting or anything like that. So we're gonna change that here. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a, an OC apply and a dash F. And in this case, I'm gonna just do our rate limiting plugin that you see here. Now, one of the things like once this basically um, is created, I can come back to um, our, you know, our OpenShift you know, UI and I can see that if I go look up this custom resource definition, I can see that we actually have a Kong cluster plugin and we've just got that cluster rate limiting plugin to show up and you can see it was just created a few seconds ago. Well, the next thing I need to do is I need to apply it to something. Now I can apply this plugin, this you know policy to many different, I could apply it to a service, I can apply it to the ingress, which is essentially the route coming in from outside in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just with a simple annotation, this konghq.com plugins plus the rate limit, I'm gonna apply this to this, this ingress, which is basically, as you can see here, is a standard ingress. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll see nothing too fancy other than these two annotations that just is telling us, A, we're gonna be using the Kong ingress controller, and B, I want this policy applied to it as traffic goes through. So I just basically gonna do a kubectl apply and just apply this policy right here to this, this ingress. And now when I come back here and I do my git you know, plugins, you'll see in the header that we actually do have our rate limiting taking place. And that's how easy it was to apply this basic gateway kind of um, functionality and I, of course, I'm gonna exhaust it for a second and you'll see we will get a, a 429, you know, API rate limit exceeded. So that kind of covers like what we kind of address in a really short and fast, furious way, what we kind of things we can do with the ingress controller, you know, the, the gateway coming in. But what about once it's past the ingress and we some of the governance we might require between the ingress controller itself 
to this Apollo layer, to the blog, to the natural language process, et cetera. Well, one of the things that we might want is we might actually have some mutual TLS kind of guaranteed to be happening between these different communication points. And in doing that, we can set up some zero trust. So only the things that we want to talk to each other are allowed. Well, again, since we're using this all through custom resource definitions, we have basically a tool called Kong Mesh installed on this, on this OpenShift um, cluster. And what Kong Mesh is doing is it's giving us basically a, an overview of all the different um, pods that are deployed are getting these proxy sidecars also deployed with them. And these proxy sidecars are going to proxy the traffic between these services. Now you could see we have you know our nine data plane proxies showing up for our seven services, and if I go down to the mesh, you'll see that you know we don't have any policy yet applied. So one of the things I want to do is get this mutual TLS policy in place. So I can basically just go down to a mesh definition, and you could see I just have a API version Kuma.io, and by the way, Kuma is the open source project we donated to the CNCF that's kind of behind the Kong Mesh product, which is our enterprise offering. And what you have here is you have basically a mesh, which is our default mesh, which basically correlates right to here where we have different meshes. Now we can support um, different meshes through this UI. We just happen to be using the default. And I'm just gonna define a basic MTLS policy for our mesh. I'll use a built-in CA1 cert, you know, set the expiration date, some of that. But now, um, basically, if I just go ahead and apply this, and you can see the consistency here is that we're doing this all through very native OpenShift methods. We're using our OC apply. And so I can go ahead and apply this. Now, one thing you'll notice is when I come back here, and I, I can refresh this, that you know we will see our MTLS policy now show up here. And um, of course, I can come back here and do my you know get things, and they all work. Now, you could trust me, but I want to kind of point out that there is kind of a, a traffic permission policy working that's allowing these things to talk. So if I go back to my custom resource definitions and if I just look up traffic permissions, you'll see that we actually have a traffic permission policy that's saying allow all by default. Now I'm going to do something kind of crazy for a live demo. I'm actually going to delete this traffic permission just to prove a point that without this traffic permission here, um, this is not gonna work. You know, We're basically not gonna be allowed to communicate across these, these pods. So what I'm gonna do is put this traffic permission back. Now you can see we can actually match with tags and determine what exactly is allowed to talk to each other. And so in this case, it's a demo, I'm gonna be a little lazy here. I'm gonna say everything's allowed to talk to everything, but you could see if you knew um, specific policies of things that you wanted to enable, you can easily do that through these Kubernetes tags. So now that I've applied that back, you, the first thing you can see is we can come back here and see it's, it's back, right? And of course we can now get back to our things because things are now allowed to talk. And that's kind of what I'm trying to show is zero trust. One more thing that comes up um, quite a bit when we go from a, you know, kind of a monolith to maybe a, a microservice pattern is the idea of tracing. How do we know if something goes wrong where that thing is that went wrong? Or if we have things like latency and stuff like that? Well, we, we can obviously do a lot of other policies besides just this you know, MTLS. So just to give you, a, a since it's kind of a short demo today, I want to just kind of jump to the chase and show you some of these other policies that we can implement. So we saw the MTLS, we can do things like logging, we have things like metrics, and we even have uh, tracing. And in this case, we have a Jaeger collector that will basically take um, our X request IDs and basically keep track of where these requests are going. So in other words, when we're basically going through here and you can see that we have these MTLS um, enabled, we should be basically be able to, um, I'll just control Z that. Um, we should be able to see where all these traffic going, it should be collected in our Jaeger trace. And we can see where the latency is happening, where failures are happening, et cetera. So let's just go ahead and enable this. So I'm just gonna enable all this policy. And you can see that it's as simple as just updating the mesh um, with this policy that I, I laid out here. Now I will point out that if we come back here and I refresh this, all these policies should start being filled in that we just applied. 
and more importantly, if I come back to um, you know this little plus, I'm going to add a blog. And I was saying I'm happy this whole time. I'm going to make another one. I'm not really sad, but I just want a different response. I'm going to say I'm sad and I know it. And you can see that went through. But more importantly, we can come to our Jaeger, and I can basically do a, a fine trace on this. And you can see the different stops that our X request ID hit from all between all these different services. Now I can go to the system architecture and you can see almost the journey, right? That it goes through. So we go from the Kong proxy, which is our Kong gateway, or in this case, our ingress controller that's making our ingress object. We go to the Apollo service, the blog service, and finally that natural language processing service. I think this looks even cooler when you look at it through a directional point of view, right? And so you could see like if you had a problem at any one of these points, we could easily um, basically trace this by just going to these different spots and expanding them. And we can even see the X request ID, we could see the latency. There's a lot of information we could extract out of this. So I'm just kind of giving you a quick teaser of how Kong works with the OpenShift platform. Again, uh, we are doing this through custom resource definitions. So basically it's not like if you're familiar with Kubernetes or anything, you can basically use the same kind of Kubernetes objects and patterns that you're used to. Um, and basically it just integrates really nicely and gives you a little power of both our plugins for our Kong ingress controller or our mesh policies in the case of the mesh. So with that said, um, I'm gonna, I guess, pass that back um, to Stu and see if there's any questions and anything we can answer for you. All right. Thanks, Ned, for the demo. Excellent. Um, so I was just looking. I, I, um, I don't see any Q&As from the demo. Uh, Reza, uh, I've got some questions in there that, that maybe we'll uh, you know bring up with you. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I, I guess just take one of those high level questions. Uh, you know, we talked about containers and, and Kubernetes. It seems there's always this next shiny object uh, out there. You know, virtualization, there was OpenStack for years, now there's Kubernetes. You know, serverless is coming down the pike. Um, you know, what, what's next? What do we arrive? What, what advice do you have for customers when uh, they, they, they look at this ever changing world? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I think you and I were chatting about this about, you know, OpenStack, for example, you were saying like, is Kubernetes going to be the next OpenStack? And I think that answer is clearly no, right? Um, what Kubernetes uh, has done is that it's, beco it's becoming more and more sort of the bread and butter. It's, it's just, you, you need to assume it's kind of there. Um, and I think there's, there's a couple of interesting things that spawns from that. One is, um, I was talking to Brandon Phillips, too, the, the CDX CTO of, uh, of CoreOS, and he was saying, look, what's going to happen is Kubernetes is going to become like part of kernel. It's like you got to assume it's there, right? And then you go on top of it. And over the last couple of years, we've the, one of the most common use cases, is people are building a platform as a service on top of Kubernetes. There's not so, you know, before we used to have platform as services in a package. Then Kubernetes came and people started building their own platform and service. If you talk to a lot of platform teams at big companies, they go, what are you doing on top of Kubernetes? Oh, we want to abstract Kubernetes. We want to make it sure that it's, it's like the application of don't even know it's there. So, so the long way to answer your question, my sense is that Kubernetes is just going to become de facto assume it's there. Now, what is going to be on top? Instead of you having to build your own platform as a service, what can we do to standardize more and more the constructs and the components that people are building themselves to make platform as a service, self-service automated deployment, CI CD driven deployment of these microservices happen. And that's where not only the connectivity piece comes in, but all the other good stuff that OpenShift also already brings in on top of Kubernetes in terms of the operator layer, in terms of the app layer and the app dev view and all of that stuff. Yeah, I, I guess just to build on something you were saying there, just to do a quick compare and contrast, in the OpenStack days, there was this stack that you were building out and there were all of these new projects and there was the big tent and basically you had this giant tarball that got built um, as opposed to in the Kubernetes world, we all look at the, it, it, it's, you know, it's a meme in the industry. You look at the CNCF landscape and you're like, there's hundreds of projects, oh my God. But 
here's the thing, <laughs> you know, all of those, pro you know, most of those projects that live on their own, there's lots of those pieces in there that it's not, oh, you have to build these seven things and then this one on top. Even service mesh works with Kubernetes, but it also works in, you know, some environments that aren't Kubernetes. So it is much more flexible. It's much more like a microservices architecture, API driven for what we're doing uh, in this cloud native world. So that's why it's very different. I totally agree with what you said. You know, Kubernetes just kind of becomes the new default compute. And like Linux, it becomes the fabric of our lives and gets built in everywhere. Absolutely. And I see a question coming up here. So do you want to take that one? I can I can definitely help with that one, I think. Okay, which it's uh go go ahead. Yeah, go take it. So it says in that demo, was it the operator on top of which the commands were executed? And and the short answer is yes. The longer answer, right, is that what is an operator? It's basically a Kubernetes controller that's exposing a bunch of CRDs, and then through the execution of those CRDs, it's got logic to actually reconcile the configuration and do things. And as you saw, Ned, uh, he was he was supplying those OC commands, which are acting on the CRDs, which were taking effect on the Kong runtime and managing it. So yes, absolutely. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, excellent, I saw another question there. Uh, th th Microservices are, are containerized applications. We keep getting smaller and smaller. Um, and, you know, therefore, there's just so many different pieces that I need to worry about in a single application. Uh, so, but containers are starting to get larger and larger. How, how does Kong help with this, uh, you know, application management for OpenShift? Right. And the you know, the, that's where I think the, the assumption that the world starts with Kubernetes doesn't really work, right? Uh, you um, just taking a technology stack that wasn't really designed for a containerized infrastructure uh, will probably not give you uh, enough mileage and might, might cause you a lot of pain, right? Taking a, a, a Java E server and taking it full-fledged with the hundreds of ear files that are on top of it to form the application and put it into one container, I've seen many customers struggle with that. And that's why what you said, Stu, is really important that the layers on top, like the mesh, let's take the mesh, right? Critical that it works both outside and inside of Kubernetes. Critical that it gives you a perspective on the whole thing and allows you to piecemeal then take the, the parts of the, the monolith and move them as it makes sense to the, to the containerized infrastructure and microservices world. So, yeah, I don't think it makes sense personally in most cases to take those giant uh, applications that were in the previous stack and just take them wholesale and put them on, on a Kubernetes infrastructure. Yeah, and it it really you know is it it depends you know we need to understand our applications. Don't just lift and shift it all. Don't think you can modernize everything overnight. It is something that typically requires a deeper engagement and a plan in place. And anybody that tells you they're going to have it done, you know, in a matter of a week or two, um, you know, I'd be a little bit worried about that. Um, I do see another question. Looks like we might want to bring Ned back. Um, Charles, do you, do, you, do you want to tee that question up for us? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you kind of mentioned that uh, zero, that there's a lot of shiny items out there, and zero trust is definitely one of those new shiny items. And, uh, you know, people are adopting it. It's very important. And, uh, Ned, in your presentation, you showed uh, that how it can be enforced. I thought that was really interesting. But uh, I'm wondering exactly uh, is uh, how is it handled uh, and does it apply to older applications? So can I take something older and, and bring the zero trust to that older application? A absolutely. So, I mean, Reza kind of mentioned earlier that, I mean, we definitely have a philosophy of working with your old stack and not just assuming that you have to get to the future in order to use it. So one of the nice things about Kong Mesh is that it actually can apply to, I mean, you can apply Kong Mesh to bare metal if you so desired. I mean, most people don't, but certainly VMs is could be a common scenario. And so if you basically set up this mesh, it can be reporting to the same you know, mesh control plane and you can enforce these same policies, whether you're in Kubernetes or outside of Kubernetes. So um, basically all we require is either a sidecar or that in the case of uh, non-Kubernetes or non-container would be basically a binary um, to run and just do that, you know, proxying to the control plane and you can enforce any one of these policies. 
All right, great, great. Excellent. Uh, um, let me see. Yeah, Reza, um, you know, I, I think it's a question following up on what Ned was talking about that, you know, the old doesn't necessarily go away. Um, we, we talk a lot about distributed and multi-cloud and a lot of the new pieces. How does how does service mesh play into a customer's data center environment? You know, if... yeah, um, you know, one of the things we noticed uh, back when Cuma was launched was that you can't have one mesh to rule them all, right? And you really need this multi mesh world. In some ways, if you think about connectivity in terms of the three types of connectivities, connectivity at the edge, like Ned talked about, you need to protect the building right? Connectivity between your apps. So you have multiple different application teams. They need to make sure they talk to the data, they protect the, the and make sure the communication between them is reliable and connectivity within the application. Mesh works really well for connectivity within the boundaries of the application. Like the way, you know, one analogy I like to use is that when you go into a building, you're given a, you're given a batch, right? That opens all the right doors for you, right? That's the mesh. But the front door of the building that's the gateway, right? And anybody can come to the front door and register and log and be secured, but only the people with the batch can go into the building and open the doors and everything else, right? And so having the ability to have this world where you have multiple meshes with their own badging system, while you have connectivity between them protected with different gateways, allows for modernization to happen at the right pace, which was what we were talking before, because you can say, look, there's a mesh outside that is not based on Kubernetes. And therefore, we'll, we will introduce zero trust. We will introduce MTLS-based uh, uh, authentication across all of the components, even though it's not on Kubernetes. And then on the Kubernetes ones, we'll have a separate mesh. And overall, we'll have an overall view and governance of all the services that constitute them. That's really what we're trying to achieve with our platform. Yeah, I, I think uh, Corey Quinn. I think the joke on it is, uh, what do you call a bunch of service mesh? They're they're meshes. Uh, you know, so uh, we always joke about pronunciations and titles. Uh, you know, I, I agree with Ned. It's it's cube cuddle uh, is is what he calls the command. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys on that one. It's cube cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, got got an interesting one. You know, it, it, it's funny we talk about some of these advanced things there, but uh, Vladimir asked a question about kind of the why do I need Kubernetes, you know, containers make sense. Um, you know, I want to keep my current infrastructure. And, you know, I, I guess I'll start at Res. I'd love your, you know, if you've got a good pithy answer there. But you, you go back to what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an orchestrator. So, you know, containers might get to a certain piece. But if I look at, you know, the pods, the clusters, my application, I, I need something that can manage that so that, you know, I don't want to worry about how things scale. I want, you know, this is where Kubernetes is that intelligence uh, to, to help do some of those things because otherwise containers are kind of dumb <laughs> when it comes down to it. Kubernetes is 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 got some of that automation uh and, and and manage that environment for us yeah everything you said too but i think the important thing on that question is who who is i right why do i need kubernetes who's i if you're talking about from a developer perspective in some ways one could argue that you should even not worry about the fact that it's kubernetes you do your commit to git and things happen and the thing gets deployed. Now, why do I need Kubernetes if you are a DevOps person? You know, the topic of this webcast, if you are an operator, like human operator, then all the stuff you set, right? Because it allows you for cost optimization. It allows you to abstract the, the different cloud infrastructure layers uh, and, 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 and all the good stuff you just talked about. But it's true, though, as a developer, why do I need Kubernetes? I think maybe it's some of the, what, what Vladimir is trying to get to. You don't need to worry about this Kubernetes at the end, right? Yeah, I, I guess right. Think back. There, there's a gentleman I worked with. It's what are the fundamental assumptions the developer was making? Back in the mainframe day, it was if I did something, I knew the limits that I had and I knew what the latency was if I did a write or anything like that. From a Kubernetes standpoint, I don't want to worry about the oh hey I've you know I've I've run out of capacity I've you know I can't do some of these things. It's those are the architectural things that you've had and developers, as you said, they, they, they shouldn't have to worry about that. that this is some of the boring underneath pieces. Um, there was another follow-up question about, um, does anyone use pure network policies in Kubernetes or is it abandoned in favor of mesh? I might need that on this one. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just getting my buttons figured out. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to say no one uses pure network policies or give you any dogmatic, you know, response to that. Um, I think the mesh is gaining a lot of traction just for like the simplicity of it. Just you know, probably the same reason why, you know, we've moved to Kubernetes. And if you've ever tried working with raw containers without an orchestrator, it's not a very pleasant experience. So. I I think just you know anything that takes you out of the working through a minutia type of solution to something that you could just apply with a simple policy and then move on, but also at the same time know that's doing exactly what you want. I think it's going to gain a lot more traction than you know the micromanagement uh, effect of trying to deal with all these kind of one-off network policies. You know, so I, I just I think it's kind of self-evident that it's just a time saver. You know, it's where a lot of people are finding that to be that's that's my take i don't know Russ, if you have a different thought on that no that makes sense to me right it's uh, in some ways it's an abstraction layer and, and it allows you to do that you know what i think is interesting is that technologies like ebpf are becoming super interesting to me right and they allow you to think about it that way as well while decreasing the complexity further and how ebpf and mesh could marry in the future i think to me is a super interesting topic yeah, I, I would even add things like OPA too, which we actually have policies that support that as well. Yeah, it, it, no, no shortage of acronyms, the, the OPA and the EPBF uh, and everything like that. Uh, you know, hopefully people, if you go to the CNCF website, hopefully uh, that they've got the magic decoder ring uh, to, to help everyone with that. Uh. <laughs> Open policy agent, I should say. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm familiar with OPA, yeah. Well, uh, you started the whole Cube CTL, Cube Cuddle thing. Is it OPA or OPA? That's a whole other question right there. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to because I, I I did it was one of my it was actually I think my last interview with the cube was the team that was donating that that technology there. It's a set on the yeah. So I, I I thought it was OPA, but uh, I I can be proven wrong. It's it's I, I think it's, it's OPA, right. I think um, I think there's a lot of discussions on it. <laughs> oh boy, I, I I try not to get any to, to too many arguments on that. I mean you know, you know I I live through the cloud wars um, when you know come on cloud you know is pretty meaningless as a word. Uh, to <laughs> There's enough things to bike shit about. We yeah, we don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> yep, awesome. Um, so looking to see any quick Reza. Uh, one, one question we have, if and we're waiting to see if there's any final ones before we get, to, of course, the drawing that are people are waiting for. What about predictions? What what are you what are you looking for? Uh, kind of in the next twelve to twenty four months when it comes to computing. Yeah, you know, obviously, my sense on this is going to be more connectivity focused, coming from Kong, right? Um, one prediction I would I would put out there, and based on what I'm seeing our customers talk about more and more, is the importance of what what you know a, a pattern or a problem that's been around, but for the cloud native world, which is a container or a service registry, I should say, right? Your service catalog of record. Uh, back in the SOA days or SOA days, whichever you want to call it, uh, we used to have this concept of a service registry, and where are all your services? You can discover them, you can catalog them, and uh, categorize them. In the cloud native world, this is becoming even more important because of what we started the conversation with too. The number of endpoints is increasing exponentially. And so how do you go to a single place to query these endpoints, understand who owns them, understand what the latest version is, understand how you actually consume them and also contribute to that service registry. We don't have a great solution for this yet. I think you're going to see that become uh, well addressed in the next couple of years. Yeah, uh, it, that would be one. It, it really it sounds analogous to say the, the the trend of GitOps because how do I make sure that I'm on the latest version, keep up to date? Well, you know, hey, I, I can put everything in GitHub, um, and therefore that will actually monitor, make sure, not let me get out of uh, things. So it goes back to a statement I made earlier: if you leave it up to the people, uh, people have been ruining ruining things forever. So you know, no offense, people, we know uh, we are not as good as hopefully something that that can keep us up on that. So that yeah, that's an interesting. Interesting one, Reza. Did, did did you have another uh, another thing you wanted to share? Oh, just one more thing, which is a theme we've talked about in some ways, right? In that 
Um, what is beyond Kubernetes? Well, I don't think any of us will know for sure, but a new abstraction layer is bound to emerge, right? And that abstraction, the standard abstraction layer that is more around the past so that Kubernetes becomes an implementation detail. And then you can actually think about how do I just deploy my apps? And, and what that new standard abstraction layer is, is going to be a, a really interesting question, right? Like there could be potentially huge, like just like we have KubeCon, there would be that abstraction layer con in five years from now, right? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We, we know that the only constant is change. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we will see where that goes. And as you said, right, you know, Kubernetes just get, kind of gets baked in as the fabric and, and so, some of the other things, things matter. Excellent. Charles, any other questions or are we ready to do a drawing? You're on mute. <laughs> Well, while Charles unmuted himself, um, there we go. Just one last question I see. Any known limitations with Kong API Gateway? You know, coming from Kong, I'll say no, absolutely zero limitations. But of course, that's a, you know, that's a, that question depends. Uh, I would say if you want to know more, contact us and we'll help you with detailed questions around that. Yeah, I, I think with, with that, uh, Reza, I, it is uh, if you have anything, uh, uh, questions or something, you, you watch the the presentation again and and have some questions. Go back to uh, uh, Kong and and uh, Red Hat and and you know follow up on on this to see how uh, these solutions can help uh, you and your organization. So I want to thank you, Stu, Reza, and uh, Ned. Some great information, and I I pick up a few nuggets of uh, of uh, knowledge, of course, when I. Uh, host these. And with my security background, it was nice to see the zero trust that's uh, and being able to enforce it at the application level, something very important. So now it is time to announce the winners of the four $25 Amazon gift cards. And the attendees selected are Joan A, Alan D, Joel H, and Trisha P. Now, you will receive an email at the email address you registered for this webinar with. And if you're like me and you have seven or eight emails, you'll have to figure out which one you registered with. Uh, but it will, that email you that you get will explain how to receive your, your gift. So don't forget, though, to check your spam folder if you don't receive anything. I want to, again, thank Stu, Reza, and Ned, and Kong, and Red Hat and you, our audience, for taking an almost an hour out of your day to spend it with us. Goodbye, and may the fickle finger of fate be kind to you. All right. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.